a swing to this one. Come on.
oh God, when everything fails, Almighty oh Father, we look to you, oh God. Holy Jesus, Holy Jesus, you are the one that satisfies us, oh God. Testimony say, We love you, Lord. We adore you, Lord. We lay our lives we lay before you. Somebody who Lord. loves the Lord this morning want to hear you say, We love you, Lord. We adore you. We adore you, Lord. Besides you, Lord, and beside you, Lord, no other God but you. We lay our lives we lay before your throne. There is none besides you, Lord. Besides you, Lord, and besides you, Lord, no other God, no other God but you. We lay our lives before your throne. We love you.
you, Lord, say. We love you, Lord. We adore you, Lord. We lay Even our this morning. lives Even this before morning. <laughs> your throne. We just want to let you know. We love you, Lord. Yes, Lord. We, we adore you, Lord. We lay our lives we lay our before lives. your throne. There is none besides you, Lord. None besides you, Lord. No other God. No other God but you. We lay our lives mm. before your throne. There is none besides you, Lord. God. No other God but you We lay our lives we lay Before your throne There is none beside you None beside none you beside you, Lord No other God but no you No other God but you We lay, we lay our lives Before your throne We bless you other names fade away and all the other names fade away till there's only you and all the other names fade away Jesus take your place Jesus take your place Want you help me say that all the other names fade away? Let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Till there's only you. Let all the other names fade away. Jesus. Jesus, take it. Everybody say, let all the other names. Let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Till there's only you. Let all the other names fade away. Every other name. Jesus, take your Let it fade away. Place. Let it fade away. Jesus, take your Say, let all the other names fade, let all the other names fade away. Everybody help me say, let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Till everybody's talking about Jesus. Let every other name fade. all the other names fade Even the name of the sicknesses and diseases. Jesus, take your place. Hey, I want us to say that again. I want us to say that again. Let all, Let all the other names fade away. Let every other name fade away right now. Let, Let all, all the other, other names fade away. We speak into the atmosphere. Let all the other names. Hey, sha la 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 ba se. We speak it. Hey, Jesus. All over the world, place. all over the earth, Jesus. Jesus take I want us to say that place. one more time. Jesus say it one more time. Say it all the other names. All the other names fade, fade away. away. Let every
every other name that's not the name of Jesus fade away. Let there be healing and deliverance. Let there be peace of over till there's only you. Hey, Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. All over your house right now. Let fear disappear. Let anxiety go. Jesus, take your place. Across this nation and the nations of the world. Jesus, take your place right now. Not the fear of death, not the fear of disease, not the fear of tomorrow, not any other fear. Let there be only one name that is ruling the airwaves right now. The name of Jesus says, Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. Jesus, take your place. One more time, say, Jesus, take your place. Your name, Jesus, you're the beautiful one. We love your name. At the mention of the name of Jesus, every hill melts like words. Every mountain disappears. Every sickness leaves. Every disease disappears. You're the beautiful one. Somebody who loves that name, want to say how we love your name. How we love your name. Jesus, you're the beautiful one. We love your name. We love the fragrance of your name. What do you help me say? We love the fragrance of, of your, your holy name. You came and brought it. We love the fragrance of your name. We love the fragrance of your holy name. You came and brought us into your reign of grace. You came and brought us into your reign of grace. We love the fragrance of your name. We love the fragrance of your holy name. You came and brought us into the reign. You came and brought us into your reign of grace. We came to lift up his name. We came to lift up his name. We came to lift up his name. The scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, that God has given him the name that is above every other name. God has exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is the, he is the son of the living God and he is the Lord of all. So today we came in just to magnify that name that has been magnified and has been glorified. He said everything, every knee shall bow, the things on the earth, the things under the earth and the things in the heavens. And every tongue shall confess that he is the Lord. So even right now we declare that he is Lord. Even right now, we declare that He is Lord and we magnify that name above every other name. Above every other name. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, For there is no other name given among men under the heavens by which they must be saved. We are saved by that name. Anyone that calls on that name is saved by that name. So we magnify the name that brings salvation and healing and deliverance. Glory be to God. He said, in my name you shall cast out devils. In my name you shall heal the sick. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is salvation in the name of Jesus. And this morning we just want you to focus on the name of Jesus and everything that he did on the cross. Not what you're going through. Not what your fears are telling you. Not what anxiety is trying to get you to do. But you focus on Jesus. Hallelujah. What a wonderful day. What a glorious day. Hallelujah. Thank you for tuning in this morning. Welcome to the online service this Sunday. It's a blessing and a delight just to have you 
uh, tuned in and we know that you're having an experience just as we are as well in this place. We didn't just come, you know, uh, to minister to you, but to minister unto God and to let God minister to us as well, even in this season. Um, and I pray that after we are done, you will have been lifted, you will have been shifted, that God will have raised you up in faith, in hope, in power, and you will not be the same person that you have been. You're going to be able to face the next days of your life in the confidence that you belong to God and you belong to Christ and that nothing can by any means harm you in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to release my singers right now. Praise be to God. Uh, an amazing group of people. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be to Jesus, praise be to Jesus, praise be to Jesus. Somebody slid into the inbox um, before I came on and they asked me, where is the church located? I'm following online, where's the church located after this season is over? Uh, and for anyone else that is asking that question, we are uh, in Siokimau along Katani Road, off Katani Road, Siokimau, and uh, off Katani Road around Flappy Kawash. When this is all over, and it will be, um, then you can always look for us. Or if you need prayers and counseling, if you need prayers and counseling, you can still come over in the course of the week. Uh, you will find somebody uh, just to pray with you. Or if you need somebody to talk to, there's a lot of pressure that is out there. There's a lot of uh, distress that is going on out over there. And sometimes people don't know where they can go and just talk. Well, um, you, are, you are welcome uh, just to come and be with us. You'll find somebody to pray with you. Even if you just want a place to pray from, you can always come in and then use the sanctuary and just pray by yourself. What we are not doing is we are not congregating. But for individual prayers, for personal needs, you're welcome to the office. You're welcome to just see us over here. We also have um, other locations in the city center. Uh, so you follow on the pages and then you will get to know the details. You follow on the pages the New Birth Covenant Church, Sioki Mao page, uh, the New Birth Covenant Church, City Center, Nyahururu, Meru, uh, Kisumu, Eldoret, Rongai, uh, various pages that are available to you, and uh, you can connect with us at, as well. Uh, you connect also with Changing Lives Ministries, which is based in Kitengela. You just make the connection with them, and um, you will receive ministry. The number for any prayers, or counseling as well the number would be on the screen if you need prayers if you need counseling the number is available right there on the screen hallelujah I want to go into the Word of God today I want to go into the Word of God um, just to share it we are coming back at 3 p.m. we will be right here as well we will be here as well at 3 p.m. we are doing what we have been called to do which is to bring ministry to you uh, through whatever form and we're using every opportunity every platform we're using every way just to get the word of God to reach you out over there praise be to Jesus Christ we are the Davids that are making sure that you have the bread in the battlefield we're just coming in to bring you bread in the battlefield so that no matter what you are facing whether it is in your family or your finances your faith walk uh, uncertainty about your future Whatever it is that you may be dealing with, you constantly have bread. You have the word of God just to carry you through. So we are committed to doing that at 3 p.m. today. We will be back here again with a broadcast online. And I know that you will be blessed. I want you to get your Bible, wherever your Bible is, and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18. Glory be to God. Jeremiah chapter 18. Praise be to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the porter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words 
the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. And I want to talk today about the porter's wheel. The word which came from the Lord to Jeremiah, saying, Arise and go down to the porter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Isn't that nearly ironical that God is speaking to Jeremiah, yet he says, I want to talk to you, so I need you to change location. I need you to change your position. I need you to reposition yourself so that you can hear what I am saying, yet he is talking. If Jeremiah wasn't hearing what the Lord was saying, how would he receive the instruction to relocate? How would he receive the instruction to go to a different place? Because if he's not able to hear, then he cannot even hear the instruction to go down to the porter's house and to hear the words from over there. But God says to him, arise and go down to the porter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the porter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. <laughs> there he was making something. The thing is not definite. The thing has no name. We don't know what he's making. We, we don't know whether he was making a pot or something, but he was making something out of the wheel. I dare tell you right now that even in this season, God is making something. He's making something out of your life. He's making something out of your family. He's making something even right now. You don't know it. You can't figure it out. That's why you're worried and anxious because you always want to know what God's doing and because you want to know where you are going. But he's making something. He's always doing something. In John chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus says, My father is working, therefore I am working. He's always working. He's always working. He's always doing something. Even when we don't know that he's doing something, he's always doing something. I went down to the porter's house and there he was, making something. Good God. <laughs> making something out of the wheel. And the vessel that he had made of clay, the vessel he had made of clay was murdered in the hand of the porter. The vessel, what he had done before, the vessel that he had made, he was making something. And then whatever he was making, this thing got spoiled in the hand of the porter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the porter to make. He was making something initially and this thing that he was making got spoiled. But in his hand, you see, the other day I was talking about the promise still remains. On the Tuesday, on the Sunday I read Isaiah 44. And I spoke about God helping us because he knew us and he formed us and he's called us out and he will help us. Now, God was doing something with you when he gave you his word, when he called you. The scripture says, those that he foreknew, Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. It says, those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Then he says, those that he foreknew. He predestined those he predestined, he called those that he called, he justified those that he justified, he glorified. Then he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God foreknew us and he predestined us, he set a certain end for us. He declares this end from the beginning. This is how he operates. He declares the end from the beginning. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning. So he declares this and from the beginning, what we would call the promise or what we would call a prophecy is the declaration of the ending from the beginning, is the declaration of the future to us. And he sets you on a course towards what he has promised. Normally God will have finished his work because he's a finisher. He will have finished his work and then he starts it. So in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, the scripture will say, thus were the heavens and the earth 
finished in the day that God created them. Thus were the heavens and the earth finished in the day that God created them. That when God created the heavens and the earth, then they were finished. The thing about God is that he never starts anything which he has not already done. He finishes everything before he manifests it. So the finishing is done in the spirit. The manifestation and the beginning is in the natural. So scripture would say to us that everything that is visible, according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, that the, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed, were shaped and were designed by the word of God and the things which we now see came from things that we do not see. So there are certain things that were established in the realm of the invisible and they were finished and then God began with them in the realm of the natural. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 1, the scripture says, um, and, and this is Luke writing to a man called Theophilus. He had written his first book, and, uh, which was the gospel of Luke. And he says, the former account I made, or Theophilus, of all that Jesus began, that all that Jesus began to do and teach. By the time Luke is writing this, presumably Jesus has already ascended on high. In Acts chapter 1, if you go on further, because Luke will give the accounts of Jesus having risen from the dead. But he's talking about Jesus having begun. He's talking about the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Yet the same Jesus in John chapter 19 and verse 30, Jesus says it is finished. In John 19 and verse 30, he says it is finished. So you have Jesus who, when he had received the grape, uh, the drink from the grape, the sour wine, he shouts, raising his voice, and he says it is finished. But then when Luke gives an account in chapter 1 of the book of Acts, Luke says Jesus began both to do and to teach. Because what was finished was finished in the spirit. What was finished when Jesus screamed and shouted, it is finished. He was making a declaration of a penalty that needed to be paid that was now fully paid in the realm of the spirit. It was finished that in the realm of the spirit again, the price for man to get saved had been paid. The penalty had been paid in full. But then the work of salvation and the ministry that would bring people to God, reconciliation to God, was just starting. It's what Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. He says that God was in Christ. Is it verse 18? He talks about God was in Christ uh, reconciling the world. Verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Then he says he has also committed to us the word of reconciliation. So when Christ was on the cross, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He did the spiritual part. Then he allows us now to begin walking in the manifestation of that. And we go out preaching the gospel to the people that need to be reconciled to God. So we go to them and proclaim that which is finished. We go and we tell them that everything that needed to be paid has been paid. It was finished before we started. So when Luke says, I am bringing to you an account of the things that Jesus both began to do and to teach in the natural, he just started. In the spiritual, he finished. So we walk in those works, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We walk in those works that were finished before the foundations of the world. That we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God never calls you into anything that is not prepared and that is not finished. When he makes a declaration of something, it is established. However, in the midst of the doings of God, in the midst of the workings and the dealings of God, the process sometimes leads you into a direction that you had not envisaged. Sometimes the instruction or rather the prophecy will remain the same, but sometimes there is a change in the method. Sometimes there is a change in direction. Over and over, ladies and gentlemen, you will have to learn how to handle the things that change along the way without removing your eye and your focus from what God said initially. Yesterday, we were having a discussion right over here uh, with a friend of mine about making adjustments in life. And the fact that God has promised something to you does not mean 
mean that it's going to be a straight road towards it. Sometimes things just happen. Sometimes we cannot handle it. Sometimes we walk out of the path of faith because we are either weakened or we are diverted. Sometimes things just happen along the way that seem to have changed and subverted the plan of God. Now, what really matters is not what's happening, but where you were when things are happening to you. What really matters is not what is happening, but where you were when things are happening to you and around you. Because if you understand the placing in Christ, then you know that nothing can happen to you except he has allowed it. If you understand your placing in Christ, you will know that there is nothing that can happen to you except he allows it. The scripture says to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, everything has become new. Now we are in Christ. We are no longer out there in the world. We are now in Christ. We are in him. If you go through the books of Ephesians and Colossians, you will find, and the books of Galatians, you will find Paul giving us this position. He keeps on reminding us that we are in him continually he will say that that we are in him that our lives are hid in christ colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 and verse 3 says your life is hid in christ and christ in god so we are positioned for those of us who believe in christ we are positioned in christ so no matter what happens to you no matter what is coming against you no matter what the enemy is doing around your life or do trying to do against you your position matters a lot Your position is significant, that if you are in a safe place, you don't worry about what is happening elsewhere. Whenever there is turmoil, whenever there is danger, people will run into what they think is safety. Now, the place for them will offer them the serenity that they need. So somebody will run into a place and will call it a place of refuge. Uh, They will run into a place because they're running away from trouble or from people. In the same manner, we have come into Christ. We are in Christ and we have been secured from the things that would shake the world. Does it mean that we don't go through trouble? No. We go through it, but then we know that where we are cannot be shaken. We are in him, so we know that wherever we are cannot be shaken. We know that we have received a kingdom that is eternal. We know that we have been drawn into something that is everlasting. We know that we have been drawn into something that is not changing. We know that we are drawn into something that gives us hope even beyond this life and this world in the name of Jesus Christ. I'll show you something in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 before I get back into the other portions of scripture that I want us to see. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. If you would just open that with me from wherever you are. The scripture says to us, from verse 12, If Christ is preached that he has been raised among, from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. This is, this is very important, and I'll tie it up to Jeremiah 18. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. And we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. He says if there is no resurrection, then your faith is futile. What does that mean? It means that if there's no resurrection, then there's no need to believe. If there's no resurrection, there's no need to believe because then death becomes final. Your situation becomes final. Whatever you're going through becomes final. If there is no resurrection, if there is no coming back, then there is no need for faith. The means that we need faith when we want to make a comeback. 
We need faith when we want to make a comeback. Faith is needed for us to rise up again. Faith is needed when we are facing death, when we are facing destruction, when we are facing things that look like they're coming with finality. So he says, if there is no resurrection, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, look at verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we of all men are most pitiable. If in this life only we have hope, if we only have hope in this life, of all the men, we are most pitiable. Why? Because we have, we have renounced everything of the world. We have renounced everything that is in the world so that we may follow Christ. If then there is no resurrection, if there is no other side to life, if there is no rising from the dead, then we are most miserable of everybody else. Because then we might as well just go on and live lives like everybody else is living. If there is nothing that our hope is anchored in that is better than where we are right now, then we might as well just go back into living the ordinary lives that we used to live. But I wanted to see what 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the scripture says from there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Glory, hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Therefore, since we have received this ministry, we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, no matter what is going on. Look at verse 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He says in verse 2, we have renounced the hidden things. We have said no to certain things. We stopped doing certain things, stopped going to certain places, stopped living certain kinds of life. We stopped being a certain kind of a people. Now, if there is no hope beyond this life, all the sacrifices that we have made, all the laying down of our life, the scripture says is most pitiable because then there is no reward to the life that we have lived on earth. I hope I'm communicating this word to you back there at home. That if we have said no to everything that the scripture has said we should say no to, and there is no life after this life, we are most miserable than everybody else. Now, this is the security that I wanted to have. That no matter what happens in this life, we have a hope that goes beyond this life. No matter what happens now, that's where our positioning puts us at an advantage over the people that do not know God because we have a hope that goes beyond the hope of right now. We have a hope that even if the body is destroyed, we have a hope that our spirit remains alive. We have a hope that if we lose everything on the earth, we gain everything in the heavenly places. We have a hope that if we die in this life, we forever live in the presence of the living God. We have a hope that when judgment is made, we have the hope that we will be judged righteous and that we will receive the crowns of life. Paul talking about it in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says from around verse 4 over there, he says, the time for my departure is at hand. It is near uh, around verse 5. He says, my time is about and I'm being poured out as a drink offering already. He says, but I'm not worried about that because I can see a crown waiting for me. That's what happens to people who are anchored in Christ because they understand that no matter the turmoil, the tempest, no matter what happens to them, they have hope in life and after this life, we have a hope in this life. But even if the deliverance does not come in this life, even if you are not set free from affliction in this life, you still have hope to be snatched into a greater future. That's why for the righteous, the death of a saint is not 
a loss. It is freedom from the trappings of this life. When a person dies in Christ, they are freed from the entrapments of this world. They are freed from the lusts of the flesh, from their soul. They have not been lost. It is pain to the ones who remain behind. It is gain to the one who is going. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And he says, I don't even know what I should do. If I stay behind, it is for your sake. If I choose to go, it is for my sake. Because we have a hope that goes beyond the hope that we have right now. I need you to look at Hebrews chapter 6 before we come back to Jeremiah. Hebrews chapter 6. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just walking my way there to get me Hebrews chapter 6 and from around verse 17. Praise be to God. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the unchanging nature, immutability of his counsel, the unchanging nature of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge we who have fled for refuge, we who have fled for safety to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. He says, by two immutable things, by a promise, by an oath, by a covenant, God has sworn to us, by an oath and a covenant, God has sworn to us so that we may know that he doesn't want to change what he has spoken to us, that we may have strong consolation. Why do we need strong consolation? Because there will be times of great contradiction. So we will have this strong consolation, even when there is contradiction, we have the strong consolation that God who cannot lie has sworn. He does not need to swear. He doesn't need to swear. But then just to help us understand that he is committed to his promise, he has sworn. He has brought himself to the place where he is saying, surely, as I live, so shall it be. He has put the emphasis and the weight so that we might have consolation and we might know that he is committed to whatever he wants to do in our lives. Now, he's talking to those of us who have fled for refuge. Where have we fled to? We have fled into Christ. We have moved away from the tempest and the turmoil and the shakings of the world, moving from the place where we trust in our own heart and mind. The scripture says that in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. We have moved away from the place of trusting in our own selves, moved from the place of leaning on our own understanding. We have moved from the place of trusting in our money, our abilities, in our connections and our friendships and we have run into Christ as a refuge and we are laying hold of the hope that is set before us. Which hope is this? Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19. He says, this hope, this hope, Hebrews 6 verse 19, he says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. This hope, the hope of the future, the hope that we have life after this life, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. We have a hope that there is life after this life. We have a hope that death does not have the final say. We have a hope that death was defeated. We have a hope that disease was defeated on the cross of Calvary. We have a hope that even if, even if the worst comes to the worst, we will quickly be found in the presence of our Father. We cannot be lost. When you have been called into God, when you live in Christ, when your life is given to God and you'll, you belong to Christ and your life is in Christ, you cannot lose, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot lose. The promise will remain sure. The word of God will remain sure. But even as we live in this life, then in this life we face certain challenges. We face certain challenges that come to attack us. The challenges are not supposed to rob us of what we have received spiritually. 
The challenges are not supposed to rob us of what we have received spiritually. We have to fight for the faith that we received. We have to hold on to that which we have. We have to continually fight and contend for that which we have been given freely by the death of Christ Jesus. But then the challenges will a lot of times affect you in the natural. Everything that the enemy will do in the natural is targeted to robbing you of your position in the spirit. I'm going right back where I started. Everything that the enemy will do in the natural is to rob you of your position in the spirit. It is supposed to get you to the place where you no longer believe that God has called you. He has good plans for you. You no longer are speaking like one who is called by his name. You begin to doubt and you begin to speak a very different language. You begin to confess defeat and you begin to speak more about your fears, your anxieties, about your doubts, about your, uh, the problems that you're facing more than you speak about the goodness of the living God. So he begins to shift you. Now, I've got to take you back a little bit. You got your position by your confession. You got your position in Christ by your confession. The scripture says, by the heart, in, in your heart, you believe, and that is counted to you for righteousness. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. And then he says, with your mouth you confess, and the confession becomes salvation. You accessed salvation by your confession. You got in there because you made a confession. You got born again because you made a confession. You get healed because you make the confession. Jesus would always make people make confessions. He would ask them, do you believe I can do this? And then the person would say, yes, I believe. When they make the confession, faith cannot just stay in the heart. The faith has got to be confessed. Even the woman who had the issue of the blood, she said to herself, there has got to be a confession. Faith is activated by the confession. She said, if I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Anytime the enemy wants to change your position, he changes your confession. Anytime the enemy wants to shift you from your position in God, he changes your confession. Now, he uses circumstances to get you to begin to talk more about circumstances than you talk about God, than you talk about your place in Christ, than you talk about your promises, than you talk about where you're going. Do not allow what you're going through to change what you're talking about. Do not allow what you're going through to change what you're talking about. This is how you get to know where you were placed and in faith. What do you say when trouble comes? How do you speak when you are facing challenging times? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Circumstances and pressure can only squeeze out of you what is within you. If in trouble you mama, that is what you have been having in your heart. If in trial you are complaining, then that is what you have filled your heart with. Sometimes you have to face trouble in order to get to know you. Sometimes you have to face trouble in order to get to know you. Trouble comes to introduce you to you and trouble comes to introduce God to you. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Trouble comes to introduce you to you and trouble comes to introduce God to you. You get to know yourself. You get to know what your level of strength is. You get to the reality of your depth in God, your depth in faith, your depth in your walk and your service. That's why Proverbs 24 verse 10, the scripture will say, if you faint in the day of adversity, then your strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Why? Because the test is supposed to reveal how much you have learned. The test is supposed to reveal how much you have learned. The test is not hard. The test is never difficult. The test is set for those who have studied and can remember what they learned. It is heard to the one who did not read. It is heard to the one who did not study. It is heard to the one who did not go through revision or the one who was never in class. But if you were there in class, if you've gone through your books, if you have paid attention to what the teacher is saying, if the teacher sets the test from the syllabus, the test cannot be heard. If it is set outside of the syllabus, then you can say it is heard. But God is a good teacher. I want you to see what he says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. I want you to say, to see what God does. No test or temptation has come upon you, overtaken you, except such as is 
common to man. That means he sets the test for everybody. There is no temptation that has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Then he says, but God is faithful who will not allow you who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. God is such a good teacher that before the exam comes to your desk, he has to go through the exam and he will say, I've not taught him this. I've not covered this. I have not taught her this. You cannot test him or test her in this area because we have not covered this in the syllabus. Ladies and gentlemen, every area that the Lord allows you to be tested in, he has taught you in it. I pray that it is not your memory that is failing you in the test because sometimes God will have fed us, spoken to us. Every time I'm going through something like what we have been going through in this season, I always want to go back and find out, did God speak somewhere? Is there a word that God spoke? Because I don't believe that God allows us to go into places and spaces and things and go through things that he does not prepare us for. I don't believe God will just walk you into the fire without preparing you for the fire. I don't believe that God will let you go into the waters without preparing you for the waters. I don't believe. Jesus said to Peter, he said, Simon, 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 Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. That means that before God allows you to face a test, he prepares you for it. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired. There is a test that is coming, but he says, I have, pre I have prayed for you. That's the preparation. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. An exam is coming, but I have prayed for you. Now, you know that the scripture says that even right now, he is making intercession for us in the heavenly places. He's still standing over there. He's still making intercession for you. He still speaks even now. I believe that in every situation, every test, if you will go back, if you will look back, if you will draw back, if you will pay attention, you will find that God was leading, God was guiding, God was speaking, God was teaching, God was building you up, God was preparing you, God was showing you something. He may not have been absolutely clear about what is coming, but he does not let you get into something that is beyond you. Glory be to God. And then he says, but with the temptation, God is such a teacher that with the temptation, he will always make a way of escape. Now, I'm the son of a teacher, and my mother was not like God like this. My mother was the kind of person who did not believe that a student needed to get any leakage. My mother would never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever get leakage for a student. She never believed in shortcuts. But look at what God is doing right here. That with every temptation, he also makes a way of escape. So number one, he is not allowing anything to come to you which is not common. That means that it is something you can deal with. It is not absolutely unusual. Now, we are dealing with a plague in our day. But if you go back into history, you will discover it's not the first plague. It is not the first time a plague has hit. And it has not even hit like it hit before. So there is nothing that we face that is absolutely uncommon. But then God is faithful who will also weigh it and see, is this an exam for a year two student? Is this an exam for a year four student? So he knows where you were in faith and he has to measure the weight of whatever you are facing to see whether you can set that. And he does not just measure the weight of it, but he will also make a way of escape. Glory be to God. So that you may be able to bear it. So we have a God that will teach us and then he will let us get into the test. But even with the test, he doesn't let us get into a test that we cannot bear. So the test comes to reveal you to you. That's why then Proverbs 24, 10, which I quoted earlier on, he says, if you fail in the day of, of adversity, if you faint in adversity, your strength is small. What does it mean? If you fail the exam, you did not read. If you fail the exam, you did not read. The problem is not with the exam. The problem is with your preparation. So the exam, the test, the trial comes to reveal you to you so that you can go back and you know, I'll, I'll do this with my sons every time. When they have not gotten the grades that they need to get, they've not gotten the results that they need to get, then we will sit down and find out why did you 
get this. Was the exam completely difficult? What was happening? Uh, was there something that was being tested that you did not learn? Is there something that you don't know? Uh, why you in class? Did you have the notes? We always want to go back because the exam reveals to you the level of your preparation and the level of your preparedness. That's why crisis always reveals character. It is in crisis that you know what you're able to do. It is in crisis that you know what your capacity is. It is in crisis that you know what you really have. Sometimes you think that you are okay until you face a situation that you are not ready for. Sometimes you think you are strong until you face a situation that has come suddenly. Then you realize you are not as strong as you thought that you were. Now, you have to take the lesson from it and go back and begin to ask yourself, why did I fail the test that I failed? Why was I not ready for the exam that I faced? In Joshua chapter 7, one of the scriptures that I shared here a few weeks ago before everything was shut down, and Joshua goes to God after they had lost to I. Joshua goes to God and he says, why have you allowed us to be defeated by I? Now, that's the attitude of somebody who understands that when you have your position in God, you're not supposed to lose. So he says, why are we losing? Why why is this happening to us? How come we lost to I? And God had to tell him where the problem was. God said, there is something in the camp that is not supposed to be over there. Ladies and gentlemen, every time you face a situation, you must tell yourself, God would not have allowed it if he had not built me up for it. If I am not getting it right, there's something that I'm missing. Either I'm missing out on what God gave as an instruction, or I have gotten into something beyond me. But God will not lead you or allow you to be led into something that he did not prepare you for. So anytime you face adversity, you must have that in your mind. I am built up for this. I am prepared for this. But you need to draw from the realm of the spirit to find out what are the tools, what are the equipment that God has given to you to deal with the situation that you need to deal with. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 18, God says to Jeremiah, go down to the porter's house. Go down to the porter's house. And there I will cause you to hear my words. Go down to the porter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. There are things you will never hear until you are in a certain situation. There are things. God could have spoken. When I started, I say that. God could have spoken to Jeremiah clearly. He could have told him what he wanted to say. But you see, when the lesson is accompanied by practicals, then you cannot forget it. When the lesson is accompanied by practicals, you can't forget it. So he says, I'm taking you down to the porter's house for a practical lesson in what I want to teach you today. Because we mostly forget what we just hear. We mostly forget what we just write down as notes. It's very interesting how we receive the word of God and then in a short while after that, when we are tested in that area, we forget what we learn. Just like uh, the, the sower, the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. You know, the scripture said he went out to sow. Some of the seed fell by the wayside. Some of the seed fell um, among the thorns. Some fell on the rocks and some of them fell on good soil. And even the ones that fell on the good soil, some came back 30-fold, 60-fold and 100-fold different but you see for the ones that fell by the wayside the scripture says the seed is the word of God the seed is the word of God and then when the seed is sown by the wayside these are those who when they receive the word of God they receive it gladly but immediately Satan comes and steals the word of God Satan comes and steals the word of God that's why you have people who sit in church and services and watch and they hear the word over and over but their faith is not commiserate to the level of their hearing. Why? Because some of the word they have heard has been stolen by the enemy. Some of the word they have heard has been stolen by the enemy. And then he says there's those ones who were by uh, the ones that fell on the rocks. Now those ones, nothing came out of them. He talks about the ones that fell on the thorns. And he says these are those people who will gladly receive the word of God. But again, they don't have any depth. 
There's no depth in them. There's no root. And the, this word is choked by the cares of this world. Interesting how people will receive the word of God and still allow anxiety and fear and worry. You can preach a message today about hope and they will leave the service and still worry about tomorrow. You can talk about do not worry. You can preach a whole sermon on do not worry and then they will worry about not worrying. They will worry about how can I not worry? So they spend their whole time being worried about how can they live their lives without being worried? You see, because they think that when you are too peaceful, then something is going wrong. There are people who worship their worry. There are people who worship their anxiety. There are people who worship their chaos. There are people who worship their trouble. They don't know how to live and identify themselves and define themselves outside of the trouble that they face. When they receive the word of God, whatever cares they have and the deceitfulness of riches, chokes that word so that the word of God is not profitable in their lives. There are those kind of people as well that the scripture will say in Mark chapter uh, 7, I believe, and it's around verse 12. Verse 12, he says the tradition of the elders has made the word of God of no effect. So they have a certain pattern, they have a certain way, they have a certain kind of reasoning that they have. So they make, it's verse 13, Mark chapter 7 verse 13. So they, they make the word of God ineffective because of their traditions, their systems, their patterns, their ways. If God does not come in the way that they want him to come, he doesn't speak in the way that they want him to speak. He doesn't speak through the person that they expect him to speak through. They don't receive it. So the word of God does not work for them because of their tradition. There are other people who the word of God will never work for because of philosophies. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Colossians chapter 2, and verse 8, the scripture says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So they are those that will hear the word of God, but it is not building their faith because they are so philosophical. They have a thousand ideologies. They have every reason why it cannot be the way it should be. They call themselves intellectual. They, 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 they call themselves intelligent. They say, you know, I'm not just the type to believe things foolishly. I've got to process it in my mind and all of that. I want to tell you there is no more intelligent being than the being that created your brains. You cannot be wiser than God. Your mind is absolutely minute in wisdom compared to the infinite wisdom of God. You cannot figure him out. Paul says in Romans chapter 11 and verse 33, he had been writing a lot of things about the mysteries of Christ. He had been saying a lot. And then he says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. He says the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. This is a man who has gone through books. He has studied. He is educated. He's learned. But he's saying, my goodness, the, the level of riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. He says, how unsearchable are his judgments? How unsearchable are his judgments? Now, you see what God has done. He has broken his infinite wisdom into things that are consumable. That's why the word of God will look simple. But within that word of God is the complexities of all life. Within let there be life are all the gaseous particles that are causing the sun to shine. Just in one word, let there be light. Just one word, let there be light, holds the chemistry and holds the physics of it, holds all kinds of laws in that. One word, let there be light. That's what Jesus would say to us, that there are only two commandments I will give you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and then love your neighbor. He says the whole law, the entire law is simplified in those two. Do not mistake the simplicity of the instruction to mean there is no complexity in its structure. I'm going to say that again. Do not mistake the simplicity of the instruction to mean the lack of complexity in its structure. God says to Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house because there I will cause you to hear my words. There is a place, ladies and gentlemen, that you go to and you have no choice but to hear the word of God. There is a place you get to 
and everything has got to shut down. There is a place you get to and you have no choice but to open your Bible. He says, go down to the porter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. There is a place I've got to bring you, which means I've been talking to you, which means I've been giving you instruction, which means I've been trying to get your attention. You're not paying attention to what I'm saying. There is instruction that I need to give you and it is important for where you are going. I cannot let you go into the future without this this portion of instruction because if I let you go into it you will either miss your way or get destroyed by it so I really need you to get to know what I want you to hear most times when you are on the brink of the breakthrough God will give you instruction when he brings you to the brink of the promise he will give you instruction he will take you through Deuteronomy remind you of the law remind you of your responsibility remind you of what he promised anytime God wants to bring you into something great he has to cause you to pose so that you will hear well and hear his, his voice very well in Deuteronomy 6 verse 3 he sums it up and says here O ye Israel the Lord your God is one there is a place that God brings you to so that you may know that there is no other God apart from him there is a place that God brings you to because he wants to make sure you are not going to get into the promise and forget the one who gave you the promise there's a place God brings you to where he wants to make sure he's not giving you the promise and he's losing your heart in the promise. He says, I'm taking you down so that you may hear what I want to say. I feel like God has brought the whole world into the porter's house. I feel like God has shut down the noise. I feel like he has shut everything else. He says, I've been talking to you. You've not been listening. You've been busy. You've been rushing. You've been in your pursuits. You've been praying about your own dreams. And I needed to talk to you and give you my agenda, my plan, my purpose, my blueprint for the next decade. And you were not listening. So he says, I will take you down to the porter's house. This is not a mess we are just in the porter's house glory be to God I started by telling us about our position in Christ we have not moved out of where we are we have not moved out of our position we have not moved out of Christ but we have been brought into the porter's house we have been brought into the place where God wants to do something new when he has done something before and the thing does not look like what he wants it to look like he has he has all the all the power he has all the freedom to change what he is doing in any case he is the porter he does things for his own pleasure he created us for his own pleasure we have to fit into his agenda we have to fit into his purpose we have to fit into his design he is not doing things to please us we have to fit in to please him if he does not like what we look like then he will change it the scripture says when Jeremiah went down into the porter's house he needed to hear but I don't see words I don't see words written down that the porter was talking about because there are certain lessons ladies and gentlemen that come through the experience of what you're going through there are certain lessons ladies and gentlemen that will never come through a book there are certain lessons that will never come through a classroom they will only come when you are in the porter's wheel so Jeremiah is watching he is looking at what God is doing he is looking at what the porter is doing the porter is saying nothing the thing about the porter is he is not communicating anything he is not talking to the pot he is not talking to Jeremiah he's not paying attention there are times ladies and gentlemen that God will not even pay attention to the one who is trying to get his attention because he is busy with whatever he has been making he was making something and whatever he was making was murdered in his own hands I am so glad that even when we mess it up we are still in his hands I am so glad that even when everything is going crazy he has not left the world he has not lost authority he has not lost power he has not left his throne that the enemy is not in church things may be dark but the thing is still in his hand he has the final say glory be to God
I am so glad that even when the enemy comes in like a flood, we're still in the hands of God. This is the assurance that I brought you this morning. You were in the porter's wheel. You were not on your own. You were not lost and you shall not be destroyed. You were in the porter's wheel. It's just that God has to make a new you out of the same vessel. There may be parts of us that were not going the direction he wanted us to go there may be parts of us that were not listening to instruction like we needed to listen so he has to shut everything down now we have no choice but to hear his voice and to hear his words now we have no choice we have no excuse we've got to hear him in our spirit we don't have a pastor to run to we don't have a prophet to run after now we have no choice but to pay attention to God we are in the wheel we don't know how long we'll be there we are in the wheel but what keeps me going is I know we are still in his hand he will not leave you to destruction before he called you he already set your your destination before he called you he already established the promise we may be in the process messed up in the process lost in the process but the promise still is sure we are in the potter's wheel he will turn you around but we are still in his hand Things may go crazy, turning everywhere. You losing your job, losing your mind. Don't know which way to turn, but you were still in the hand of God. If you were in his hand, the same way he made you in the beginning, he will make you again. He said in his word, look at what the porter is doing. He says, that's exactly what I will do with you. As the porter makes the clay into whatever he wants, that's what I will do with you. When the porter or whatever is being made gets murdered in the hands of the potter he takes the same clay and begins to do something else he's doing something else I came to declare today there's something else that God is doing in your life he's making a new version of you he is upgrading you I know everybody in the world is talking about 5G they have nothing on what God is doing with you they have absolutely nothing the natural always relates with the spiritual if the world is coming coming with 5G. God is coming with something higher than 5G and God is not into technology. God is into people. He's raising another generation of believers. He's raising us up in the spirit. He's raising us up in dimensions of faith and power and purpose, clarity, sensitivity and accuracy. God is raising up our level of connectivity to him. They are saying 5G is the internet of things. They have not known God who holds all things by his power. They have not known God. In him all things exist. In him all things subsist. In him all things are created. Everything is connected to him. He is the real 5G but he's raising another generation of believers. People who will see miracles in their houses. Not running after everybody and saying pray for me but right now rebuking the devil in their own houses. He's raising another generation. God has put us in the porter's wheel he is raising up something else I am so glad I am in this day to see the works of God glory hallelujah I gotta finish right now I gotta finish he says I'm the vessel that he made I'm so glad that God always has a second and another and another chance and the vessel that he made of clay the vessel he made was murdered I'm glad he didn't throw it away I'm glad he didn't throw it away he still used the same one you must understand we live in a day of grace in the days of Noah when he was tired of that generation he swept all of them away in our generation when he is tired of what we are doing he will bring us down into the porter's house he will put us in into the porter's wheel he will do it again because before he started he already finished with you so he made it again I'm glad he's making me again I'm glad he's making me again after this is all over you won't be the same person everybody knew you to be he's making you again you will have to be reintroduced to people who knew you my good God I even feel that the social distancing is 
spiritual because you have to isolate in order to reintroduce if you were too crowded together they will always go in the way that they knew you so God is saying I've got to pull you out Abraham come out of your country out of your people out of your kindred out of the people that have known you so that when I bring you back you are not coming in as Abraham you are coming in as Abraham glory be to Jesus I'm so glad God did not throw you away you used to be prayerless but he's working on you right now you used to be stubborn but he's working on you right now you didn't pay too much attention to the things of God but he's working on you right now he's making another vessel he's making a greater vessel he's making a more powerful vessel he's increasing your capacity it may be painful right now but you were just on the wheel I need you to shout it out to the people in your house look at them and tell them I'm on the potter's wheel I'm on the potter's wheel he's giving me new ideas new inventions I'm seeing where I lost it I'm seeing where I went wrong I'm seeing what I need to prioritize I'm seeing what is important I'm seeing who needs to be in my life I'm on the potter's wheel he's taking me round he's bringing me back to the place of what he said to me he is speaking deep down in my spirit I'm on the potter's wheel ladies and gentlemen the devil is not in charge of the wheel it is God the enemy may have put you there but he's not in church he's not the one who determines what happens right there you were still in the hand of the living God it shall be well with your house it shall be well with your family it shall be well after this and I want to proclaim there will be an after this because God is just making out of this something new what the devil meant for evil is turning around for good I can see glory coming over your life I can see glory coming into your household I can see glory coming into your ministry I can see glory I can see glory because we are resetting we are putting everything back to place we are coming back into order I can see glory anytime glory is coming people have to set things in order this is not really a disruption this is the porter's wheel we are right there right now God is making a new vessel I pray you will not miss out on what God is doing right now glory be to God you can as well shout in your house hallelujah to the name of the living God hallelujah I went down ah, I went down to the porter's house and there he was Woo, I felt the anointing and there he was and there he was there he was there he was Levi that means he never left there he was <laughs> I went down to the porter's house he made the house he built the house he created the world the devil didn't create it so there he was he has not left he's an he's not an absentee father there he was he's in the house he's right here in the world he was in the world and the worlds were made by him and the worlds did not know him he is still right here he is still right here there he was I went down to the porter's house and there he was making something I want to be about I want to be part of the something that he is making making something glory ha most times when you are busy with your hands you can talk too much when you are busy with your hands you don't talk too much most of the times you can talk while working at the same time he is working anytime God looks silent he is busy doing something you cannot talk and be making something at the same time you will mess up what you are making God seems to be silent because he's making something Something. glory hallelujah he is making something out of your life don't let the devil tell you God left you he is right there in the porter's house don't let the devil tell you God has forsaken you he is angry with everybody no he is making something he's making something out of the politics of this country he's making something out of the church in this country he's making something out of the education system in this country he's making something out of the families in this country God is making something he is not absent he is making something at the wheel <laughs> he's making something at the wheel he's making something at the wheel and I came to announce I am that something oh yeah <laughs> I am that something he's making at the wheel Woo. you were that something he's making at the wheel I am oh you were that something he's making at the wheel you were that something 
You're now learning how to be home by seven. You're now learning. You're now learning how to obey orders. You're learning how to leave in honor. You're learning how to leave in order. He's making something. You are the one in the wheel. <laughs> He's using something that is invisible to bring order. He's using something that is invisible. But he's teaching you for where you need to go. You need structure. For where you need to go, you need to have discipline. For where you need to go, you need to have priorities. For where you need to go, you need to be able to draw from your spirit. For where you need to go, you can't just be living like you used to live before. You have the something that God is doing at the wheel. God disrupted heaven to come and save you. Don't you think he can disrupt the world to save you from yourself? If God, if God could disrupt heaven to save you from the world, don't you think he can disrupt the world to save you from yourself? 